Good morning, everybody. Pastor Mike here with the return of the Pure Bible Study. No, I didn't. Haven't stopped doing it. Still doing it. Still studying through. A, we're doing a pure Bible study, which means that we're studying only the Bible. No other books here, and we're studying a Bible that is pure, 100% bona fide, which means good, good and faithful, something like that. But it is absolutely pure. The words of the Lord are pure words as silver, tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. It's what I believe about the. I cannot believe the book that God wrote has mistakes in it. If you want to believe that, that's up to you. But we're doing a pure Bible study here. Galatians chapter 4. Uh, Galatians deals heavily with the real gospel versus the fake gospel gospel. And the fake gospel, Paul said, is not a gospel. It's not good news. It's not good news to tell people that they have to do perfectly the works of the law in order to be saved or to remain saved. And I've seen doctrinal statements. I've listened to teachers. I know what they believe. I know what they teach. And I'm telling you that we are saved by nothing but grace through faith. Our belief and our trust in what God said. So today, Galatians chapter 4, we're going to look at the first seven verses. We're going to deal with this issue of salvation by way of examining what Paul says here, that we are the adopted sons of God. Galatians chapter 4 verse 1. Now I say... That the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. Now consider our situation right now. If you are saved, you are an heir through Christ. The Bible says we are joint heirs with him. So what Jesus receives, we receive. But right now, we are children. We're in a childlike state and we are servants even though technically we're going to come back and reign with Christ for a thousand years and this whole world is going to be ours. All right? But as under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. It's interesting that Paul used that word elements. Um, Witches, pagans, New Agers, Microsoft, Google, they use the same ideologies as the four elements. Um, and these four elements represent four spiritual forces which are seen in the Bible as principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. They are what the fourth kingdom is in Daniel chapter 2. Um, we, were, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. And by the way, the word elements is mentioned four times in the King James Bible. Okay? And let, let me just go through this very quickly. We have the real gospel, which says believe and receive. We have the fake gospel, which says you must perform or you must invoke the four elements because even the Kabbalistic Jews have a form of the four elements. They call it the four worlds. And they also believe in four levels of understanding the Torah. The fourth level comes to you by way of divine revelation and not from the words that are in the Torah. That ought to tell you something right there. And they believe it that, that you attain that fourth level of understanding uh, by way of performing what the Torah tells you to do. That is a false gospel. To perform works or be under the bondage of the four elements, which are nothing but devils and familiar spirits, is a different gospel than believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and being saved and receiving the Holy Spirit. So we have, you can live under the four elements, or you can live by the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You take your pick, okay? Uh, so anyway, the elements of the world, verse 4, But when the fullness of the time was come, 
God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. God taught me a lot. Um, Lisa and I thought we had all of our children raised. Uh, we had four children, uh, three girls, one boy. And then God laid it on my wife's heart and then my heart to take in, by way of adoption, a child that wasn't ours. And God taught me a lot about that because God taught me that in order to raise him the right way, I had to love him like he was my own son. And I'm telling you, the way that God loves me as an adopted son is no different than the way God loved Israel as his natural sons, the children of Abraham. So we are the sons of God by way of God adopting us in. Verse 6, And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And again, that word Abba. No, it's not a uh, Northern European rock band. Okay? It is what Hebrew children say. It's one of their very first words. doesn't matter what language they speak. It just seems like the very first words that a child speaks is his mother and his father. Now, they never say, Father. I understand these are my first words. Do you understand what I'm saying? No. They say here in America, Dada. Or maybe uh, in some other places, Papa. They say Mama. And it's because it's the easiest things for those young lips and young tongue and young teeth, the easiest phrases for them to form out of their mouth. God designed it that way. So with the Spirit of God's Son in us, yes, He is our Father, but it's much more than that. He is Abba. We are the small little children who can just barely utter God's name, Abba, or Dada, or Papa, or whatever. We can just barely do it. So all of this nonsense about, oh, you must say God's name in the correct Hebrew form, or you're not really saved, you're not going to heaven, if you don't do it in the correct Hebrew And they argue amongst themselves about what the correct Hebrew form is. Right here it says, Abba, Father. That shows that you are, you are close in relationship to God. You really do see God as your father and no one else. So I can remember years ago in my prayers, I don't say um, God, dear God, so much. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying that when I came to this awareness that I was his son, in my private prayers to God, I call him Father. I, my earthly father is, has died and gone on to be with the Lord. I only have one father left that I can talk to, and that is my Abba Father. So the more I call upon him, the more I grow, the closer I am in my relationship to God my Father. And that's how we see our relationship with him. He is our father. We are his sons. We are his children. And we have the spirit of his son in us, the same spirit that Christ had. And so we don't see God as this far away off entity that cannot be reached. When we cry to him, he hears us just like a father would. All right? Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Now, uh, needless to say, as I am understanding my relationship, and by the way, those of you who are young men and young ladies, I encourage you, get married and have children. The reason why I say that is, I went to Bible college and I learned everything I could out of theology books. All right? But I understood then the relationship that God has with me when my first child came in to this world. I now was her father. She was my daughter. And I did everything for the sake of my daughter and for the sake of my children. That changed me. It, it, gave, me, it gave me an understanding of God's relationship with me 
by way of my relationship with my children. And so I delighted in my children. I loved my children. I tried to work hard for my children. I, the things that needed to be done in my life, I remember very clearly praying to God that he would do a work in my life for my children's sake. Because my children needed a good dad. And I pretty much stank at it. So even the very things that I was asking God to do for me, I was asking him to do it for the sake of my children. God, whatever sacrifice, whatever you have to kill off in me, however you have to break me, then break me. But do it for the sake of my children. And that's, that's how God loves us. He sacrificed his only begotten son so that he might receive unto himself us adopted children. And Jesus is never jealous about his little brothers and sisters and what they're going. But Father, you promised me Antarctica. How come I can't have Antarctica? Yeah, he's getting Antarctica. Jesus is not jealous that way. We are joint heirs. You know what that means? Equal with Jesus as far as receiving the inheritance. All right? So anyway, so I started studying what the Bible said about God's relationship to his children and his children's relationship to God. There are expectations of us from the scripture as children, just as we have expectations of God as our father. Now, let's go to John chapter 1. And let's start in this study. I may get done today, I may not. But let's get it started because I think it is something that is very, very much needed as far as understanding salvation. Yes, this is a salvation teaching because you are not saved if you are not a son. And if you are a son, then you are saved. That's really all there is to it. And understanding that relationship will help you understand salvation. John chapter 1, verse 11. He came unto his own, meaning Christ came to his own people, his own brethren, the tribe of Judah and all the Jews, and his own received him not. Man, what a... It's like showing up... Uh, it's like showing up to your own birthday party and everybody's there but no one cares if you're there or not okay it's like yeah the thanks for inviting us to this great party but they don't regard it as your birthday party everybody's partying amongst themselves and celebrating each other they rejected you that's jesus coming to his own people they hated him they hated him so much they said give us give us that murderer barabbas that that scumbag out of prison We'll take him, you kill Jesus. Okay? So, and God had this all planned out. This was not God going, why did they reject me? I don't know what to do now. God already had it foreordained that it was going to happen this way so that he could offer salvation to the Gentiles to provoke the Jews to jealousy. So the Jews show up now at our party and say, what are these Gentiles doing here? These scumbag Gentiles, what are, what are they doing in our place? Okay? It's going to provoke him to jealousy one of these days. He came into his own, and his own received him not. Verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. That's our relationship. We received him uh, even to them that believe on his name. That's salvation. It is by God's grace that he calls us sons. But it is through our faith that we receive it. Because, and I don't know exactly what all John Calvin said, I don't really care. But if John Calvin or anybody who calls himself a Calvinist says, all certain people are predestined to be saved whether they believe or not. No, it's not what the Bible says. Well, you know, predestination. God has already pre-selected everybody to be saved, and that's, they're just going to be saved. Now, they may pray one time and believe one time, and then they can go out and become a lesbian, you know, atheist witch and work against the kingdom of God all the rest of their life. But because of a technicality, God has to accept them in heaven. I don't believe that. That's not what the Bible teaches concerning being a son. 
It is done by way of God's grace through our belief, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So, let's, let's do this, okay? Here's all the losers of the world, all the lost, unsaved, unbelievers. And here's all the Christians of the world, the saved, born again, spirit-filled sons of God. Let me, how can I say this? God already knows from the beginning of time to the end of time, God already knows all the names of the people who are lost and will go to hell. God already see, God sees all of human history all at once. There's nothing past, present, or future that is hid from his sight. So, how does God then select people from before the foundation of the world? He sees them. He already sees them because God is above our linear time and God sees everybody who has believed and abides in that belief, God already selected them because he knows the outcome of their belief already. Here's all the loser lost people. God knows that they are going to go to hell because he knows the outcome of the sum of their life that they are unbelieving, unrepentant sinners. God has already written their names down, yes, you're going to hell. God already knows it. It's not that God just randomly picked people before they came about and said, well, you're going to be saved whether you want to or not. I mean, you're already on the list, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to take you off the list. Okay? It's not that way. It's not that God doesn't know the outcome of all your choices. He already knows it. It's like, like if God played the lottery. If God played the lottery, what lottery number would he choose? Let's say the let's say the lottery was going to be one billion dollars. And God was going to play the lottery and he was going to buy a lottery ticket. What lottery ticket would he buy? He would buy the one that he knows is going to be the winning ticket. So in God's case, it's not gambling because he it's a sure thing. He knows that this number is going to be the outcome of that. That's that's what that's how God has predestined. Peter said, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. That foreknowledge is God knowing all of our choices, all of our decisions throughout all of our life, and he knows that the outcome and the sum of our life is that we are believers in him. Okay? I hope that makes sense to you. I hope it makes better sense than maybe some of the arguments that you were a part of. So anyway. It's not, we're born, not by, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. A church, then, cannot have you go through a catechism, learn to say all the right answers, and then say, you're now a member of the body of Jesus Christ, you're going to heaven, because we said so. That's not how it works. No church and no man can designate someone as either saved or lost. It is not man's choice. It is God's. Okay? God is the one who makes that choice. Turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body... He shall live. Let God every day crucify another part of you. Let God, as the husbandman of the vine, of the vineyard, dress the vine. Let God purge off some branches on us that are no good. And God's not going to just do it all at once. <laughs> I got it all at once. That's not how we remove the enemies out of the land of Israel. He did it one at a time, a little bit here and a little bit there. And this is what God is doing in our lives. One day he works on this issue in our life, 
and one day let's say it takes God 10 years to bring us to a place where we're far better than we were 10 years ago well that took that all that work through 10 years or 20 years or 30 years of your life God was slowly but surely purging the vine and he was mortifying the deeds of your body so those of you who are you're under conviction about certain things in your life and you're saying God please take them out of my life God please take them out of my life God will God will God will answer that God will answer that prayer better than you prayed it every single time but he'll do it in his time and his season so as God has patience with you you have long suffering and patience with God that he is going to do what you asked him to do or better than what you asked him to do it's like Paul asking God three times get Take this thorn out of me. This messenger of Satan buffet me every day. Take this thorn out of me. And God said, Paul, I'll just give you grace. I'll leave the thorn there, but I'm going to give you grace. And Paul said that was better. Paul, he rested in that. I'll take the grace. And you know me? I'll take the grace every time. Okay? So anyway, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God they are the sons of God now you know I, you know I preach against adding and taking away from the from the Word of God in Romans 8 he mentions the spirit quite a bit so remember what Jesus said the words that I speak unto you they are spirit so look at Romans 8 uh, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit if we take what we just said, that the Word of God is equal to the Spirit of God, we can say, to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Bible. You walk being led by the Word of God. This Bible, it is our life. It is how we live. It is how we chose to live. And this Bible works in us things that we cannot work ourselves because it is the, the super strong, super sharp, two-edged sword of God. And it is alive and it quickens us and it does things in us that we could never do ourselves. Okay, So when you read the Spirit here in Romans 8, think Bible. Uh, so let me read that verse again. For as many as are led by the Bible, the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Then... Verse 15, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage, again, to fear. You're not, and I, I know people, constantly in bondage and fear because they, they've been told that every sin they commit, they're going to go to hell again. You're going to go to hell if you keep doing that. Well, if they are sons of God, God's got it. God's handling it. The issue, let's say, let's say that Let's say that you have a real issue with you love Jack Daniel's whiskey. And before you got saved, Jack Daniel's whiskey was your life. Okay? And God saved you. And you said, well, I can't drink Jack Daniel's no more. Okay? Well, that lasted a few weeks. And then you were drinking Jack Daniel's again. And you felt bad. God, I failed you. Okay? God chastened you. Don't do that again. A month goes by. You're with some friends. Here comes the Jack Daniels. And you just can't turn it down. God's going to chasten you again. How many times will God chasten you? As many as it takes. And I'm going to get into the chastening part of this sons of God issue as, as we go through this. But you'll understand that as a son of God, you don't just get to do whatever you want to do and still be saved. Because God has a remedy for dealing with sin and sinfulness in us. It is called his rod, his chastening. Now, if you won't accept that chastening, the Bible's very clear. You're not a son. You're a bastard. And you receive no inheritance. 
That, to me, is as clear as anything else is to me in the Bible. God has dealt with me in my life on issues that he did not instantly take away when I got saved. He did not do that. Now, and think about this. When we get saved, we ask God to take away our sins, do we not? Then why should we expect that people who want to, want to be saved, want to go to heaven, why should we expect them to do what they knew they couldn't do and they asked God to do? Is, is it because we believe, well, you ask God, but God expects you to do this yourself? Is that, where is that? Where is that in the Bible? That if we ask God to do something in our life, God says, no, nope, I'm going to do it. You're going to do that one yourself. And if you don't, I, I'm, I'm not going to receive you. No, that's not the Bible. What is in the Bible is God, in his time, in his season, will purge things out of you. He'll do it by chastening. He'll do it by strife. He'll do it by uh, tribulation and trials. He will, he will run you through the course, and at the end of that course, you're finally free of what you ask God to take you and make you free from in your life. And you're never going back. That's how it really works with God's sons. Not this, well, do that 12 more times, you're going to lose your salvation. Or, do that 100,000 times, God doesn't care. You're still under grace. It's a technicality, yes, but you're still under it. It's not that either. God's going to take care of it. If you're his son, you are not going to just get away with doing whatever you want. God does not raise his children that way. I didn't raise my children that way. And God's not raising you that way either. Now, back to this. So, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again unto fear. You don't fear... Um, the only thing you should fear as a Christian is have a fear of the Lord. The only thing you fear is that when you do something and you know it's displeasing to God, you know it's a sin, then by all means, you should fear what God is going to bring down on you because it ain't going to be pretty. But what he's doing, he's doing it for your benefit so that you can be saved. All right? Verse, uh, let's see, for you not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. There it is again. Galatians 4, 6, and 7, and then uh, Romans 8, uh, 15, and 16. The spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. There's your double witness right there. So if you have your Bible out and you're in Galatians 4, right next to verse 6, right in Romans 8, uh, 15 and 16. And then when you get to Romans 8, write in Galatians 4, 6 and 7. All right? Because they're double witnesses. They're saying, I mean, almost exactly the same thing. Giving you the evidence that this is the doctrine of God. Every Out of two witnesses or three, let every word be established. And here we have an establishment of a doctrine that with God's Spirit in us, it causes us to cry, Abba, Father. And, in the, and if we are in that relationship, God will take care of you. Oh, he'll take care of you all right. But you know what? When God's done chastening you, what does he do? Loves you. Comforts you. The same hand that chastens you is the hand that draws you in. It says, I love you. What I did, I did for your benefit. Not to satisfy me but to make you a better person. And even when you were a child, there are certain things your mom told you not to do, your dad told you not to do, you did. And they gave you a whipping, but you didn't, you didn't take the message. You thought, I can get away with it again. So you go do it again. You get caught again, your mom and dad whip you harder the next time. How many whippings does it take before you finally say, uh, not again, I'm not doing that again. The last 12 beatings I got from my mom, I didn't think I was going to live through them. I, I'm sorry, but I'm not doing that anymore. Did you know I quit playing with matches? When I was a kid, 
would love to play with matches. Me and a buddy of mine burned his treehouse down accidentally because we was up there playing with matches, lighting stuff, and one wall of that treehouse was an old tent canvas. <laughs> we barely got out of there. Fire department had to come, put the tree, it was like the burning bush of Moses had to put the tree out. I had to wait all day for that whipping. And when I got it, it was bad. But I didn't learn my lesson. I went out again, not too long after that, playing with matches again, caught the woods on fire. Fire department has to come out and put, put out the forest fire that I started. Got a whipping for that one, too. And you know, I reached a point where I didn't play with matches anymore. And to this day, I don't play with matches. You see how, you see how it works? We do childish things. But God makes us grow up, and we don't do those things anymore. That's it right there. Um, verse 17 of Romans 8, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. There it is right there. Joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him. See that? That we may be also glorified Together. And Christ suffered, didn't he? But he didn't do anything wrong. He was suffering, not for his own transgressions, but for ours, to satisfy the just demands of God. But we, as joint heirs with Christ, the Bible is very clear. We will suffer with Christ. Not every day is going to be bread and butter. Not every day is going to be, oh, I'm living high on the mountain. I'm going to stay here. I'm not ever coming back down. You're coming back down. You are. Down deep inside, you know. I've been on that mountain. I've been on that mountain thinking, you know what? I'm just going to stay up here. I, I'm not going to go back down, do that stuff again. I'm not going to play matches no more. But you know what? That was pride in me. And God put me back down where I needed to be and humiliated me and humbled me so that he could raise me up again. It's just like spring, summer, fall, winter, spring, summer, fall, winter. Okay? Verse 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You know what a lot of people want? They want the glory now. They don't want any suffering. They want all the glory now. And it's not time for the glory. The suffering's going to come. Then the glory. And some people don't, they just don't, they have a hard time re accepting that. They've been told by somebody that once they come in and they're saved, then you shouldn't have to suffer for anything, right? You shouldn't have to do anything. That's not how God raises his children, all right? Verse, uh, let's see here, verse 19, For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. We have the title sons of God. We're like in the womb. And mom and dad has named us already, but we're not there yet. But it's coming. Verse 20, for the creature was made subject to vanity. Vain things in this world. Stuff breaks, people die, heartache comes. There's vanity and, and vexation in everything in this world. It's not your best life now, Joel. And I, I'll just say this. If Joel is living his best life now, what does that tell you about what he's got coming after he dies? You can have it, Joel. You can have it all you want. Um, the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Hope is how I live. Hope is how I get through my day. If I didn't have hope, that all the sufferings that I go through are for a greater cause and God will give me a blessing at the end of it, I wouldn't go through this stuff. I'd be out. We live by hope because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Shall be delivered. We're not there yet. Now my grandmother, she's there. My other grandmother, She's there. People in my in my family, 
My brother-in-law, he's there. My granddaughter. All she knew in her five-week life was suffering. She's there. The suffering that we go through will not even be able to be compared with the glorious liberty that we're going to receive. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption. To wit, to wit means, I'm going to explain this, I'm going to give you wisdom, the redemption of our body. When my son was in the court system, we were already in line to adopt him but all the time he was in the court system he was not legally adopted if we would have died before the judge declared the decree he couldn't legally receive any benefit from our death because he was not a legal heir even though he was in line for the adoption he hadn't received it yet then the judge declared, this is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to give this child over to this family. And that's exactly, and on that day, he became a legal heir. And that's what he's talking about here. When we, not now, but when we receive the redemption of this body, when we take this old body, hand it in, God will take the new one. Then it's legal. Then we will be joint heirs. Then we will receive the adoption. Then we will be manifested as the sons of God. But right now we only have it in title as the sons of God. I hope that I hope that kind of makes, it's it's like you go to the car dealership and you see the car you want. And you know how the dealer does. Well, that's a good car. That's a good price. I've already had ten people looking at that same car. Well, don't let them take it. And you hand him $500 for a down payment on it. That's guarantee. That's a earnest money, right? That's what's in Ephesians 1, um, where Paul said that God has given us the earnest of his spirit in us. Okay? So God has given the, God's given the earnest means that he has signed the contract, and he's established the contract, and it will be fulfilled... And as his earnest, he's giving us his spirit. For our earnest, we give the dealer $500 and say, don't you dare sell this car out from underneath me. Until we get the paperwork done, and until we get everything moving here, and the title is in our name, you better not sell that car from out from underneath us. You gave $500 so he would hold it. That's This is where we are right now. Okay? that the earnest has been paid and accepted and we're going to get it. Philippians 2. I love this. I needed this. Philippians 2.14 Do all things without murmurings and disputings that you may be blameless harmless the sons of God that ye may be blameless and harmless. Okay? So again, those things are coming. We have them as a title. We have them as a promise. We have the earnest has been established. It's going to happen. But it hasn't happened yet. Uh, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. You see, in the Old Testament, the sons of God were the angels. Job establishes that fact. When the morning stars sang out, the sons of God shouted for joy. The Old Testament, the sons of God were angels. And who were the angels? The stars in the heavens. What are we going to become? We're going to shine in this dark world as lights. Just like the stuff. God promised to his seed, to the seed of Abraham, they would be as the stars of heaven for multitude. Did he not? And then look here. Now as, son, as sons of God, 
in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Think of two snakes making your DNA. That's crooked, right? God's going to make the crooked thing straight. That's unfolding the DNA and straightening it out. And I love this. Um, and then he's going to make us as the stars of heaven. The sons of God are going to shout for joy. And we're going to be as lights in a dark world. Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. See, this word of life is what the sons of God stick to. Lesbian, atheist, witches, oh, they prayed a prayer when they were eight years old down at the Baptist Bible camp. But now they're lesbian, atheist, witches, and they do not hold forth the word of life. You see what I'm saying here? So, the question is, if salvation makes us sons of God, and someone prays a prayer when they're a little kid, or maybe one day they're in their 20s, and they just ran out of hope, and they came to a church, and they prayed a prayer, but they're gone and turn out to be the devil's renegades there are some would say well technically they're still going to go to heaven but I'm seeing in this book that there's no evidence that they ever really became sons of God you see just as in the parable of the seed and the sower some people receive the word for a while but when tribulation and temptation comes when suffering comes I don't need this and they cast it off so it would be really impossible to say that they were saved when no salvation ever existed saved means I was drowning in the Mississippi River and they pulled me out that means saved but if I'm drowning in the Mississippi River and they grab me, but my thrashing about causes them to let go, am I saved just because I was grabbed? I don't see it. Okay? I do not see that scripturally. What I see is God, who has children, does not let them become lesbian atheist witches. He chastens it out of them. That's my point here. 1 John 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. See, we're not like the world anymore, are we? God's beaten it out of us, isn't he? Beloved, now are we the sons of God. We have that title. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Think of a child in the womb. The, the proud father says to everybody, look here. And the shining wife, she's kind of embarrassed. You know, everybody's looking at her. I'm going to have a son. We're going to call him Jack. Okay? And he's my son. But it doesn't appear yet what he's going to look like, does it? Nobody can see him. Just wait for nine months to progress. Then we'll see him. Nine's a number for fruit bearing, just like a woman with nine months. Okay, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Hallelujah. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. And again, this is the point. When you see people struggling and striving to live the life that God has called us to live, I see people whom God is purifying to be his sons. There's somebody that calls here about every week. And about once a week, I'll take his call. 
and he confesses things to me. He confesses things that he doesn't tell anybody else. And he is someone that really is pretty weak. Um, he struggles with a lot of issues, and I know what they are. The reason why I like talking to him is because with me, he's very open and honest about who he is, what he is, and what he does. And he says to me, Pastor Hogger, please pray for me. I've not done well this week. I just feel like I can't live right for God. I just I feel like it's just one defeat after another. And I always tell him, those defeats that you're suffering through are God conquering you. Those defeats and those struggles, what God is doing through them is that he's purifying you. Um, those struggles that you're going through as long as you will allow God to take you through them, that right there is the evidence that you're saved. And I have no doubt. And this guy tells me stuff, and I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that I'm going to see him in heaven. Because in his struggles, he always cries out to God. And he's, he's like a lot of us. He, he feels like, and if I... If I, if I keep doing this, am I still going to go to heaven? And I say, as long as God can still beat you over it, you're going. Let God, you ask God, I say to him, did you ask God to take these things away from you? And he'll say, yeah. I said, did you mean it? I, said, I think I did. I said, I believe you did. I believe that you asked God to take these away from you, and you told God, God, I have no power in me to take this away. God, will you please take this away? So, and I say, if you ask God to take them away from you because you couldn't, why would God then expect for you or wait for you to do it yourself? I said, God doesn't. You ask God to take it away because you know that only God can. And if you ask God, he's either going to take them away from you or he's going to give you grace. And that's always better than taking the thorns away. Okay? God is in the process of purifying every one of us. And we will be like promise you. That's how it's going to happen. Alright? There's still a lot more here. And uh, let's pick those up next week. I want you to study uh, Job 5. Write that down. Job 5. And Hebrews 12. Okay? And then I want you to study 2 Samuel 7, 12-15. And then Psalm 89, the whole Psalm 89, okay? They're double witnesses to what I'm going to show you next week, okay? We have types in the Bible of this doctrine. God drew a picture of it for us. He shows us who's saved and who isn't, okay? So you study that out. Don't read any writings of, of uh, John Calvin or anything based on John Calvin. Don't read anything from Jacob Arminius. Don't read, don't read anybody that's not Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, James, Peter. Okay? Don't don't read these people. Don't read those people. Read these people. Here's where your doctrine's going to come from. Not from them. They're not apostles. They're not prophets. Don't believe the denominations. Just because the denomination said this is what you have to believe. God's not going to say, Are you a Baptist? You're, you're, you're what? Pentecostal? Get out of here. That's not God. God is going to want to know one thing from you. Do you believe what I said? Okay? So read this. Study the things that I'm showing you. Go back through these verses. Study them yourself. Shut me off. And then do your own study. Okay? I love you.
good to be back doing pure Bible study. I missed it. Missed doing it. Okay? But uh, you pray for us. We pray for you. You're the reason why we do what we do. Support us if you can. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.